Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander history and culture. Acknowledgement to country. I would like to show my respect and acknowledge the traditional owners of the land, elders past and present on which this remote gathering is taking place. I'm sure that we have all heard an acknowledgement to country or a welcome to country, but I wonder how many of us have stopped and really listened to the words being spoken and what's the difference between them. An acknowledgement of country can be performed by a non-Aboriginal Australian and is doing just as the title states, acknowledging the traditional landowners. For me, this statement signifies recognition that I am not a traditional landowner, that I am not Aboriginal. My ancestors have travelled here. These are not my lands. So just as I would not step into someone's home without acknowledging them first, I am acknowledging Aboriginal peoples and ancestors who are the traditional landowners. By acknowledging elders past and present, this statement signifies a respect to, the, to traditional knowledge, culture and law. A welcome to country can only be performed by a traditional custodian from that particular country where the event is being held. This is usually a recognised elder from the local community. This elder welcomes people to their land. You can see this map of Australia. This is Aboriginal Australia. You can see all the different, uh, different colour-coded and the number of different lands prior to colonisation where Australia was eventually divided into the states and territories which we know today. If you go to this website down the bottom, this is actually interactive and you can have a look and see the different, the different country across Australia. Campuses and country. Um, I really liked the the outline that you can see here. So Wollongong, um, that we're on Darrell country, um, same as Loftus, and you can sort of see the different country that you've either travelled through or are um, currently on. This Welcome to Country is a app that you can download um, and it actually uses your location uh, and software on your phone and it actually tells you which country you're in. terminology. Aboriginal basically translates as first inhabitant or from the beginning and indigenous comes from the Latin word indigna which means native to the land. I really want everyone to notice that both are in capital letters and will be throughout the rest of this presentation um, as it should be in your assignment as well. The the term the, thir the fourth world is a term that I came across in my readings and found it to be really interesting. It comprises of countries that are characterised by their experience of being colonised by a dominant group. Many fourth world countries have been forced to assimilate and have lost their land, their economic base and their autonomy. I'd like to think of other countries across the world which this has happened. So you've got the America with the um, Indigenous culture there as well as in Canada. And it's really interesting when you start looking at papers that are coming out um, in terms of overcoming um, health disparities in these sort of countries and how that would apply to Australia as well. I really love this little quote that Aboriginal is not a, is a non-Aboriginal world, a word. It didn't exist until white people came over on their boats. Who are Indigenous Australians? There's great diversity among Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. Different histories, different languages and different cultural norms. Just looking back at that map that you saw at first, you can see how diverse it is. In 2011, the census, 669, 881 Australians identified themselves as Aboriginal and or Torres Strait Islander, which makes up 3% of the total Australian population. Prior to colonisation, it is estimated that over 600 different clans, groups or mobs lived on the mainland, which is signified in that, in that map. 
So colonization. During the 1700s, there was mass exploration out of Europe. Ships were being sent across the world to explore and to colonize. As Europeans spread, so did their attitudes, scientific beliefs and theories. Ethnocentrism was the belief that Europeans were superior to all. Xenophobia is a morbid fear of foreigners or anything that was that seemed unfamiliar. This Protestant work ethic which placed importance on achievement, materialism and wealth as an indicator of God's grace. These, core, these three core beliefs shaped much of the actions and soon, be, and soon to be laws that were placed upon or rather inflicted upon Aboriginal Australians by the first settlers. Terra Nullius is a perfect example of how in 1770 the British arrived to Australia and a state of Terra Nullius was, dis, was declared. Terranalius basically translates to nobody's land, which meant that Aboriginal inhabitants were seen as flora and fauna. We're just going to have a quick look at the policies. So colonisation, we saw this declaration of Terranalius, which meant nobody's land, um, which meant that the land was dispossessed. Fences were put up. There was institutionalisation of institutionalised racism. Being viewed as flora and fauna meant that Aboriginal Australians could be rounded up and placed in slave labour camps. There were massacres, intentional and unintentional. Europeans brought with them all kinds of diseases that Aboriginal people had not been exposed to and many died. In some areas it is estimated that 60% of Aboriginal Australians died due to disease during those first initial years of colonisation. Then came the White Australia policy. This systematic racist policy wasn't only directed at Aboriginal Australians but all marginalised groups. There was a notion of this true blue Australian which sadly still continues in our culture today. Then came the protection through segregation. There was, there was this belief that Indigenous people were inferior and that they would die out. This led to Aboriginal Australians being removed from country and moved into missions and reserves. So this was the time of the stolen generation and the generation of this word Aborigine, which is very racist and it's, um, it means someone who's identified who isn't permitted to drink, vote or receive any social benefits. Next came assimilation. Which was, which was started because the government noticed that, hang on, these Aboriginal people aren't dying out as we originally thought and it was assumed that all Aboriginal Australians would adopt this Australian lifestyle, customs, law, traditions. So up in the top left hand is an image from Rabbit Proof Fence which is a great movie that um, documents the stolen generation. And this is an image of uh, chain gangs of Aboriginal workers that were forced, that were in forced labour camps. There's a small, there's an island off of Western Australia called Rock Nest Island, which is now home to a beautiful retreat centre. But it was one of these camps. It was a forced labour camp, which is almost equivalent to the extermination camps of the Nazi era during Europe in Europe. This is an image that's out of your textbook. Um, it goes through, it summarises some really fantastic data of the stolen generation. It's on page 119. Please have a look at it. It's um, quite interesting and it, it relates it to, to, um, to the present day and how it's still continuing. So policies continued. So this is integration came after assimilation, which meant that Aboriginal Australians the were acknowledged as the traditional landowners and could now be counted in the census. So they were now recognised as Australian. Self-determination came, which restored the power to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people to self-determine. So basically Aboriginal Australians could now make their own decision where they would live, who they would marry, where they travelled, which was removed 
which was removed under the Protection Act. Aboriginal Australians previously had to grant permission for these life choices. Self-management followed. This came with a strong push for land rights, separate legal, health and housing services. Shared responsibility came about in the early 2000s. The Office of Indigenous Policy Coordination was established and programs such as No School, No Pool started where, where kids aren't allowed in the local community pools if they haven't attended school. And finally, in 2014, the Indigenous Advancement Strategy, which streamlines all activities and have been responsible for programs such as Closing the Gap. If you have a look in your textbook on page 87 to 96, yeah, actually this policy table goes into a lot more detail. So in 1914, there's an image um, of police rounding up Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples and um, in 2014. So some suggested watching it's not examinable, but it really, it totally counts as study. So you've got rabbit proof fence. And when I upload these notes to Moodle, um, you'll be able to click on these links. Um, the Sapphires is another really good movie. It, it, go, it looks into that stolen generation uh, themes and the racism that continues. You've got a secret country and then the utopia. This is a link to the whole movie as part of your pre-reading. You are to watch a 15-minute um, slide of the Utopia film um, that just looks through some health disparities. Some references and resources that are used and you should look at that might may be helpful in putting together your assignment.